I'm really sorry we can't be at Harwell, enjoying the customary coffee and conversation in the marquee before all streaming into the lecture theatre. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be back uh, doing that next year. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the team at Rouse Space for working so hard to deliver this year's Appleton Conference online. Um, I always look forward to this conference in December. It's a great opportunity to reflect on the achievements from the previous 12 months and to catch up with friends and colleagues in the sector. Uh, I remember speaking last year, having just returned from the ministerial meeting in Seville and telling you all about the boost to the UK subscription to ESA programmes, a total of £374 million pounds a year. Uh, in retrospect, given the challenges that 2020 has brought, this increased commitment was even more important for the sector. We can move on to the first. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows a breakdown of our investments in ESA programmes in 2020 in euros. Of course, these investments come back to the UK space sector because of geo return, averaged across all the programmes. And there have been a raft of new contracts awarded to UK companies in recent months on projects such as the Truth's Climate Change mission and the Clear Space Debris mission. Uh, and I was pleased to see ESA give the green light to the Aerial Exoplanet mission, which I think we'll um, be able to hear more about uh, later today, hopefully. Uh, last month, which has fantastic leadership from Rail Space, our hosts, and UCL. Um, next slide, please. Um, last year, I spoke about some of the work we were doing with the NHS to support use of space technology in healthcare, and I'm delighted that we were able to strengthen this partnership in 2020 and fund a series of projects with the support of ESA, ranging from GPS guided drones to new apps to help identify vulnerable communities during lockdown. And this image shows two founders of a company called Appian, which we funded through the programme. Hamid and Christopher are both trainee doctors who started the company as part of the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Programme. They aim to establish a network of secure air corridors for electric drones to navigate via GPS, delivering COVID samples, test kits and PPE. Uh, and it was really great to see the application of space technology during this time of national crisis. And I very much hope it's opened people's eyes to the potential of our fantastic sector to meet challenges faced here on Earth. I had two main concerns back in March when the scale of the COVID pandemic became clearer and the country entered lockdown. One was for the health and well-being of our staff in the UK Space Agency, and the other was for the potential impact of an economic downturn on the space sector at large. So we began working immediately with UK space across the sector to ensure the government support was accessible and that information was flowing effectively between government, industry and academia. And as space is one of the UK's critical national infrastructure sectors, we also had responsibility to ensure that security critical operations were maintained throughout the pandemic. I'd really like to thank everybody in the sector who contributed to the requests from the agency for information and helped shape our response to this truly unprecedented situation. Um, I was confident in the resilience of the sector before the pandemic, and I do remain cautiously optimistic that we can emerge stronger than ever. Just looking back on highlights from the year, um, a clear message that we heard loud and clear uh, from many of you was that the most important thing the UK Space Agency could do to support the sector was to continue to deliver what we'd set out to do before COVID hit. And despite the challenges that we faced throughout the year, I'm proud of what we've achieved and I'm excited about the future. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So, Despite the um, pandemic, we've taken really excellent strides towards the first launch from a UK spaceport with the US-UK Technology Safeguards Agreement signed in June, followed in July by the consultation on spaceflight regulations. The Sutherland Space Hub, where Orbex will operate from, received planning approval in August. And in October, we approved Lockheed Martin's plans to operate from the Shetland Space Center. All eyes are now on Virgin Orbit as they plan a second test of their Launcher One system in the US before bringing it over to the spaceport Cornwall. And you may have heard the Prime Minister talking recently about the ambition to have the first UK launch from 2022. Uh, and I think it really is fair to say that the countdown to launch is well and truly on. 
In July, we launched the pilot for the National Space Innovation Programme with an initial 10 million pounds available for Earth observation and connectivity projects. Both, of course, are great areas of expertise of rail space and five million pounds for international projects. And we have selected more than 20 new projects as part of this brand new programme and we'll be announcing them very soon. I, will, I would encourage you all to look up the details on our website once available as they're really great demonstrations of some of the innovative ideas coming from the sector at the moment. This year, we've also pushed ahead with a new program to support national capabilities on space surveillance and tracking, incredibly important issue with many countries across the world um, raising uh, this up their list of priorities. Um, we funded seven projects um, to help, help tackle the growing threat of space debris. Um, we also uh, carried out work mapping a GNSS system and completed that in September. And we're now um, taking a broader um, look at a range of space-based options that could meet our national requirements for ministers con to consider. In exploration, we had the disappointing news in February that the Rosalind Franklin Mars rover wouldn't launch until 2022. But there was a chance to celebrate the UK science contribution to NASA's Perseverance rover, which launched successfully in July and is due to land on Mars, as I'm sure we all know, in February next year. Uh, and uh, if, like me, you've been enjoying this fantastic opportunity to observe Mars uh, at its closest point from the Earth uh, for two years, I'm sure you've enjoyed uh, that opportunity to see the red planet in all its glory in our night sky. And we were one of the first agencies, um, if I can move on to the next slide, to sign the Artemis Accords in October, a crucial set of principles that will help govern this new age of exploration as we look forward to humans um, returning and indeed going forward to the moon. Um, so um, the next slide, please. Um, a really big um, uh, emphasis within uh, government over the last year has been working across government on space and in particular with our colleagues in Bayes and the Ministry of Defence on our national space strategy. While laying the groundwork for the establishment of the new National Space Council, the Cabinet Committee on Space, which is now up and running. Uh, it's hugely encouraging that despite the immense challenges of the past year, government ministers remain very clearly committed to the UK space ambitions and understand the potential of the sector to generate significant economic growth as we recover from the impacts of coronavirus. And there have already been some early joined up successes from this approach. We've been working closely with colleagues at the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office on the UN resolution to agree responsible behaviour in space, which was formally adopted on the 6th of November, with 150 countries voting in favour. We've also been working very closely with the Department of Transport on the Space Flight Programme and with the Ministry of Defence on the development of a National Space Operations Centre. And it really is vital that we take steps now to protect the orbital environment, given how much uh, we rely as a nation on satellite technology and given our desire to be at the leading edge of the new space economy. I was also really pleased in that context to see progress on the ESA Clear Space One mission, um, which will be the first to remove an active piece of space debris from orbit when it launches in 2025. Deimos in the UK will play a leading role designing the attitude and orbit control system, thanks again to our increased ESA subscriptions. Astroscale, who also have a significant presence at Harwell, are also pushing ahead with their ELSA-D mission next year to demonstrate debris removal technology. So next slide, please. Another big development this year, and one that has attracted plenty of newspaper headlines, was the government's investment in OneWeb. And it's great that the company is now recruiting again in the UK and plans to launch its next batch of satellites later this month on the past path to completing its constellation. Um, this was, I think, a really welcome vote of confidence in the space sector by the government. And I'm looking forward to working closely with OneWeb to maximise the UK's role in the low Earth orbit economy. And I firmly believe this is a real area of opportunity now for the future, um, in particular with falling launch costs and um, allying themselves to the great progress in miniaturization of space components 
and of course the huge growth in the data economy which I think you know Covid will have only accelerated and of course it's been very interesting to read that the European Commission is now also looking into proposals for a similar constellation. Um, we've also been encouraging OneWeb to continue their engagement with the astronomy community over the potential impact of their operations on observations and radio astronomy. And we have such a rich heritage in astronomy in the UK, and it really is important, uh, important that the voice of the community is heard, as I know it will be through the work of the Royal Astronomical Society and others. So, um, final slide, please. Um, so looking ahead to next year and beyond, I'm really personally confident in the power of vaccines and I've been buoyed by the recent results from the clinical trials. But it is clear that the economic scars of COVID-19 will take longer to heal. And I'm sure many of you listened to the Chancellor last week as he set out the spending review. Good news, the sector is that the government has redoubled its commitment to increasing R&D spend with almost 15 billion pounds allocated for the next financial year. Uh, we're in the pro process of working with our parent department, Bayes, to understand what this means for the UK Space Agency's budget. It is clear that space remains a priority, and we will also be working closely with the Ministry of Defence following their record spending settlement and the recognition of the importance of space capabilities to the UK's future security. I really want the UK Space Agency to be taking the lead on thinking about where the space sector is in the next 10, 20, or even 50 years. We want to be bold here, and the recently announced studies into space solar power, the idea of using satellites to collect zero carbon energy from the sun and transfer that back to Earth. This is science fiction at the moment, but so were reusable rockets not so long ago. And we know that uh, climate change and the transition to a net zero economy will be a key theme for next year with the COP26 climate conference due to be held in Glasgow in November. I'm also looking forward to the launch of ESA quantum satellites in February and the James Webb Space Telescope in October, fingers crossed. And like every year, there will be an incredible array of new projects and initiatives from all of you and the sector more generally that we can all look forward to celebrating. So it's clearly been a difficult year for all of us, but as Chris said, it's been um, absolutely astounding and um, incredibly um, uh, uplifting to see how everybody has responded to the challenges. And I think despite all this, again, as Chris says, there have been some really significant achievements for the UK space sector. Um, I really hope that we can um, learn from these virtual conferences, but return to um, uh, being together uh, physically. Uh, and I do very much look forward to seeing as many of you in person as possible in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Graham. Um, we have, we have uh, in the tradition of the Appleton Conference, uh, a nitty gritty question from the audience for you. Um, it's, does the US-UK safeguards agreement not provide more challenges to UK companies developing launch services as they will now have to compete with already established technology from the US? Um, well, I think, We'll hear fairly soon from um, uh, Lockheed Martin, I hope, on, on what they plan to do. But, um, you know, the small launcher market is being quite innovative. Um, large rocket technology is not necessarily the technology that's been used for small launchers because small launchers are trying to do something slightly different. They're quite often looking to be responsive, as we've seen with um, uh, Skyrora. They're using actually rocket technology that has its heritage in the uh, UK uh, Black Arrow program um, uh, because that is a very responsive uh, technology and allows the uh, rocket fuel to be stored, you know, fairly simply without the need for um, cryogenics. So um, I think actually this is quite an open uh, field and uh, the UK companies such as Orbex and Skyrora um, don't seem to be lacking any confidence in taking on the world. And indeed, this will be a global marketplace. So, you know, being in the UK is not going to insulate people from um, market pressures. Um, they're going to have to compete against uh, all sorts of uh, other operators from all around the world, no matter where they operate from. So I'd say, actually, let, let's bring on that competition and incubate it and um, use it to make the UK um, based companies as strong as possible. Okay, that's brilliant. So 
We've, we've got just time for one more uh, question. It says, what, were you, what are you most excited um, about in 2021? Okay, so um, I am very excited, I have to say, about uh, Mars, and despite the fact that um, uh, we're not uh, able to celebrate Rosalind Franklin uh, landing, I'm really excited to see um, Perseverance uh, hopefully landing successfully in February, and obviously James Webb Space Telescope, as I've mentioned as well. So on the science side, some really exciting things to look forward to. I think it will be very exciting to see OneWeb um, get its constellation up. They're very ambitious. Um, they obviously stalled a bit after getting the first 70 odd satellites up, but they want to get the rest of the constellation up very rapidly. So it will be amazing to see um, the OneWeb constellation operating. And of course, it will be very interesting to see how Elon Musk operates as well. Um, obviously, I'm looking forward to making you know, really good progress in the UK on our um, uh, objectives of strengthening uh, joint working across government. And I'm particularly looking forward to building our relationship with the MOD and doing work on uh, space surveillance and tracking at the National Space Operations Centre. So those are some of the things that really excite me about uh, 2021. OK, thanks, Graham. Um, sorry, I said it was the last question, but we've just had a, a question which maybe you can answer in a couple of words. You may want to take a, it may be better to answer this after Joseph has spoken. Um, how do you see, um, could you provide an update on the UK's continued involvement in the EU Copernicus programme? The answers may be no, or we don't know. Well, it's, it's, all I can say is it's a very live issue at the moment, um, and um, we are very much negotiating um, with the intent of remaining part of that programme. So um, uh, that's uh, probably most I can usefully say, but uh, okay. you know, negotiations are ongoing and they are still ongoing, and uh, yeah. you know, we're still working towards that outcome. I mean, certainly I'm aware from uh, the conversations I've had with people in government that there is a very strong understanding of the importance of Copernicus. So I, I'm sure I'm sure that is understood. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, thank you for the hard work you and your agency has been doing for the last year and keeping things on the road. Um, and um, we look forward to hearing from you again next year with um, all these other new exciting things under the belt.